Some of you know that I, like lots of men, have dumb hobbies. Um, well, it's, I don't think it's dumb. Several years ago, ten years ago, a friend of mine who I had the privilege of doing youth ministry with, uh, he knew that like aviation was something that I loved. I had a grandpa who worked in aviation and even in Billings. I know you're not familiar, but there's a spot where you can turn off and like just park by the runway and watch airplanes come and go. And it was literally my favorite study slash prayer slash read slash nap spot in Billings. And I, I had one of these when I was a kid, but my dad and I never put it together. And so this friend of mine, so he knew that this context and knew this dream. And then one day he and I stumbled into the hobby shop. At the time it was in the mall in Bozeman. And uh, we started talking to the guys. And, and they started talking about how you learn how to fly these things. And I didn't know it at the time, but you take two radios and you essentially yoke them together. And then the guy who knows what he's doing pushes a button. And the guy who doesn't gets to fly. And then as soon as they let off the button, uh, the guy who knows what he's doing is flying again. And so we started talking about how fun that would be to do that with high school students, you know, to get out on the field and get out on the, it, it, there's a little RC airport in Billings, just like there is in Helena, and, you know, fly and talk about life and Jesus all at the same time. And several months later, he surprised me at a dinner uh, with a, a gift. I had just graduated with my bachelor's degree, and he and his wife bought me everything that, that you need. It was like $500 worth of stuff to learn how to fly RC airplanes. And that embarked a journey, which I think I've talked about before. The first thing I did was got my finger in the propeller. And it's still there, but still a little weird. Uh, you know, and then along come kids and more kids. And our family vehicle was a, a Subaru Outback, which I just sold. Yes. Um, so it got more and more difficult to get out to the field with three kids in the back seat. And these, the plane that I learned on was a 70-inch wingspan airplane. And then another guy gave me like an 85-inch wingspan plane. And so as I was looking at these 14-inch props, like three inches from our infant baby's face, you know, and we decided that it was probably time to liquidate all of the gasoline airplane stuff, and I converted to electric flight, which is, you know, technology such now that the only thing you're missing is the sound of a gasoline engine running, which is a lot. Uh, and then when I moved here the first summer in 2009, I joined the local club, and we flew, and, and then as hobbies go, like some of you have canoes, and some of you have hunting rifles, and some of you had fishing rods, and some of you, I don't, I don't know what it is, that collects dust ever since your kids had a life of their own. And mine was RC airplanes. And then, uh, it's probably been a few weeks ago now, the boys and I watched Red Tails, which is a terrible movie, like terrible acting. It's a good movie, but the acting is horrible. And so that got them thinking flying, and then they saw the airplanes. I mean, they've known the airplanes are in the basement, and so they started asking me to fly, and I was too cheap to spend the $29 to buy my membership again. And eventually I did, and we've started flying again. And this last Tuesday night, in between those storms, I was flying with them and some of their friends. And, and the next morning, is what I'm getting at, I was, I was running. He was running. And uh, I was thinking about the series that we're in. And if you're a guest this, I'm going to do my best to bring you up to speed, but we're kind of midway through the movie, so to speak. And... Uh, I think, honestly, I was really wrestling with God and checking myself because I'm well aware of the fact that like, this conversation we're having is, is pretty integral and uh, very important and a little bit risky and, and a lot scary. And part of me just going, like, God, like, strike me dead with lightning if that's what you got to do and just kind of processing this stuff with him. And it hit me in that moment of, like, there's a, there's a principle to flight that I think uh, illustrates what it is that we've been wrestling with. When you're flying, whether it's RC airplanes or the real thing, I've never flown the real thing, nor do I really have the desire because I'm that guy who doesn't need high doses of adrenaline, and when I pile one of these into the ground, I drive home. <laughs> so, uh, but there's a principle that applies to, to aviation in general, whether you're talking RC or not, and, and it's, it's that when, you know, there are moments where you get disorientated. Uh, whether you're flying an RC airplane or you're flying the real thing, there are moments where you kind of lose track of what's up and what's down and w what direction the airplane's going. And particularly when you're flying RC, like things are happening rather rapidly, and so it's easy to uh, kind of panic. Especially when it flies over your head, there's something incredibly disorientating about the plane flying directly over your head, and you, you kind of you just freeze. And there's something that you're tempted to do, uh, and yet if you do it, it's, uh, well, destructive if, if you do. And the same thing, you know, that's why uh, Doolittle had to invent instruments. Like, it's really easy in a real airplane to, as weird as it sounds, lose track of what, dire what direction up is. And, and when you don't know, there's something that you're prone to do, though it'll probably get you killed. Uh, the, the other time this comes into play is, do you, do you remember the movie Top Gun? Minus the scandalous scenes. Uh, I watched it with my boys this week, minus the scandalous scenes. Though I might have only been fooling myself, I'm not sure. But, uh... 
Do you remember when, remember when Goose dies? Remember it's Goose and Maverick? Nostalgic emotions coming through you. Should we sing the song? <laughs> I should have done that as a preview. Um, <clears throat> but remember what happens is he goes through that jet wash and he ends up in a flat spin and there's this Maverick's panicking. I'm in a flat spin, I'm in a flat spin, I can't get out of the flat spin. Remember that? And, and they're just spiraling and eventually they got hit eject and Goose's head hits the bottom of the canopy and he dies and John, Tom Cruise holds him in the water and he cries. And, um, <laughs> well... A flat spin is actually a real thing. It's happened to me with an RC airplane, and, and I piled it up, like, didn't get out of it. And, and what, it, what it refers to is literally, like, the plane is spinning and moving down, and what's happened is the physics have stopped working for you. Because the physics, of course, are that the plane has got enough forward force that it's creating lift on the wing. And yet if things occur, like what happened in that movie, that result in there not being any forward motion, any lift, then all of a sudden the plane is just falling out of the sky. And the only way to get it out of that is to somehow run it out and gain some speed again. And yet there's something that is much more natural, much more intuitive to do, and yet if you do that, uh, you're sure to die. See, see that one thing is uh, what you're prone to do is to grab the, the control stick, uh, the yoke. And of course, uh, in, in an RC world, this is that. And, and this is up, and this is down. Down is up, and up is down. See, this, the theme this morning is chasing ourselves in circles. Um, the, the, the temptation is to grab the stick and pull down, to pull, uh, to make yourself go up. Because the, uh, your intuition, particularly I can speak to when you're flying RC airplanes, is it's real natural to go like, well, if nothing else, I want to head up, not down. Like up is always better than down when you don't want to go down, right? And you're in the air, and so I'm just going to go up, and I'm going to buy myself some time. And yet when you're in a flat spin and you pull down, what happens is the, uh, the elevator can very easily not function as an elevator, which co controls up and down. It functions as an aileron or a rudder, which actually uh, causes the plane to spiral even in a tighter turn and die that much more quickly. And that's what I did to my RC airplane. You pull up and actually what you're doing, and you don't know it, you're causing it to be even more out of control. Same could be said, uh, you know, it's, it's possible, though we can't imagine it, to be upside down and not know it, and you pull up, and actually what you do is you veer straight into the desert floor, and what was it, some 15 years ago, that happened in the southwest part of the country. An Air Force pilot was flying inverted, but didn't realize he was inverted, and went to do a hard climb, and actually went straight into the desert floor and died before he even realized that he was going down, not up. But even more, I think even more likely is, is that what happens is you, you just send the airplane into a steep climb. And what we don't know because we watch movies is that most airplanes minus uh, Air Force jets can't do this maneuver. Like that most airplanes aren't powered enough to do this. Most RC airplanes can as well because it's disproportionate. But, but what happens when you, when you pull up is the plane does this and there's not enough power for the plane to do this. And so before you really know what's happened, you've stalled the airplane. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the motor has stopped running, though that too is possible. What it refers to is one of your wings has stalled, which means it's lost lift, which means now uh, you're cartwheeling to the ground. See, so there's this thing, and I guess that's what occurred to me that morning, was because, uh, God, this whole notion of rules and how do we navigate our freedom, and it's certainly not with rules, it's rather counterintuitive. It seems natural to go, uh, my life's out of control, my friend's life's out of control, I'm a little wigged out by my own uh, decision-making, I'm a little wigged out by this person I love's decision-making, and the natural thing is to grab rules and say, those are the answer. And yet what we've been exploring in this series is, well, what if, what if it's not? What if that actually uh, brings about a more quick destruction? And hopefully this isn't just me and my opinion and, using yours, you and yours, but I mean, it seems like this is central to what Jesus talks about. Even in Matthew 5.20, uh, at the beginning of what became his greatest sermon or greatest collection of teaching, he, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. See, he's offering this rather poignant commentary on the guys in his day. And what he's saying is, uh, and what you see when you read the remaining chapters is, hey, their righteousness isn't bringing about any character transformation. Like, they follow the rules. They, you know, they don't commit adultery. They don't murder. They're following the rules, but their, their character, their life is completely untouched. Uh, there's another place where Jesus is, He's, he's healed a man. This man has been, uh, ha has had whatever issue that he healed him from his entire life, and Jesus heals him, but it's on the Sabbath. 
And the religious guys, rather than celebrate God uh, rescuing this guy from his situation, particularly in a culture where it just didn't accommodate that, they, they get all bent out of shape because Jesus broke the rule. And you can just sense Jesus' indignation when he's talking to them, like, wait a minute. So you're telling me that the rule is more important than the person? Time and time and time again, Jesus returns us to this conversation of, I know that you think rules are the answer, but they get you in more trouble. And so the question we're asking in this series, though, is, okay, so if rules aren't the answer, what is? Because it's really easy to remove rules from the equation, but what we're left with is a lot more questions, isn't it? Like, have you noticed how hard it is to navigate your freedom? Have you noticed how hard it is to follow Jesus? Have you noticed that you, you face these moral quandaries that are, that are unscripted? Have you noticed you, you deal with these dilemmas where a black and white answer would be kind of nice? Especially as a person that's going, God, I'm not playing games with you. Like, I'm sincere. I love you. I am saved by grace. I want to honor you with my life. So let's stop playing the game. Tell me what to do. Like, have you noticed that there's times where the text is, uh, is unclear? That it's not black and white to kind of an unnerving degree? Like, part of what occurred to me this week is, like, like not only are rules it seems outside of God's plan and, and not only do they rob us of relationship, but could we also say that they're impractical? That, that a rules-based approach, it's just not possible. It's not honest. I mean, can you really script out every situation and a rule for every situation? It, can, I mean, it, it's kind of silly, especially if you're a parent. Like, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write a rule for every situation that my daughter's going to face as a seventh grader. No, you're not. The only person you're going to fool is yourself. That can't be done. And it raises this question of like, well, like for me, I don't know about you, but there are days, maybe 40% out of them, like four out of the 10, where I would much rather have a manual that was black and white and told me everything to do, wouldn't you? I got an Amazon this week because I was just curious when I had that thought of like, I wonder what kind of odd manuals, like how-to manuals one can buy. We've got a few. Uh, there's how to make a silencer for your 22 rifle. An entire book. Uh, there, there's this one, which is less funny in light of what's unfolding in Aurora, but there's the Batman how-to manual. And, and we have the table of contents, that, which you probably can't read unless you have Batman goggles, but uh, like how to become a crime fighter, how to make a bat suit, how to assemble a, a utility belt, how to make a bat signal. I mean, I know these are like, I'm going to church because I want to know how to train a sidekick. How to build a bat cave, how to throw a batarang, how to throw a grappling hook. I mean, really? There's, there's this one, um, how, how, to, how to take care of your Ford tractor. A whole manual, like how to restore and take care of... I mean, come on, we got life to deal with here, like kids to raise, like Jesus to follow, things to do. There's people that have time to read the whole manual on how to restore your Ford tractor. There's another one that I pulled the image down because I chickened out, but it's still funny, so I'm going to say it. There's a manual on, it's called a, How to Get a Married Woman to Have Sex with You, dot, 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 if she's your wife. <laughs> I wasn't really sure how that'd be received, but it's funny, right? Like, <laughs> there's, all, there's all kinds of manuals. Ever wondered why, like, Jesus didn't write one? Like, why didn't he write this rule-by-rule rule thing? And I got to tell you, part of what's occurred to me this week is maybe that speaks to his intelligence. Like, maybe it speaks to the fact that, that he was uh, not only God, but he was the smartest person to ever walk the planet because maybe he understood what so many of us struggle with, that it's not possible. That, that for him to, 2,000 years ago, to have written a manual that would have you, that would allow for you to perfectly navigate every situation as you try to live this God-honoring life, is, it's just not taking like, the situation seriously. And yet again, I think that leaves us with this question, like it's easy, and this is what I'm good at, like it's easy to deconstruct, but okay, so now what? And that's what got us to Galatians. And, and you need to know, like, this wasn't like I had all this mapped out in my head two years ago, and thus I decided we need to do this series. This was like four and five months ago. I started wrestling with these questions and walking through these step-by-step -step answers that I'm wrestling with myself and discovering myself. And what we did last week was we looked at Galatians, where, where, where the suggestion 
among many scholars is, is that our situation was the Galatian situation, that the Galatian people were, were these Jewish and, and, and some Gentile people who were reconciling what does it look like to live God-honoring lives in their context, and it was a, non, on, a non-Jewish context, and because it was a non-Jewish context, like they were following Jesus without lots and lots of the ceremonial stuff, without the temple and without the Sabbath, and, and they were realizing these honoring ways to follow Jesus separate from Jewish culture. And yet they, like you and I, reached these situations where they went, uh, rules, rule, need a rule. It'd be much easier if I had a rule. And that made them susceptible to this historical movement that we know as the Judaizers. And these were these uh, people who loved Jesus and they, they were convinced that Jesus' movement was, uh, was a patriotic movement, that, that to be a Jesus follower implied being a Jewish person. And really what they believed was that you, the, the law is what translates the how-to piece and they were susceptible, they were vulnerable to, to buying that answer. And what, what Paul is doing in Galatians is responding to that situation and going, hey, 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 I know where you're coming from, but it's not how you navigate freedom. And in fact, the culmination of, of that text, in, in, in my view, is Galatians 5.16, where Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And what Paul argues throughout Galatians is that Christ is sufficient for salvation and the Spirit is sufficient for navigation. That you you don't need rules, you need his Spirit. With all due respect, God, like I appreciate the honesty with the text, but I kind of feel like I just spun a circle. I mean, we started with this really, really nebulous question, what's option three? And and if, if my studies are accurate, we landed on, well, the Holy Spirit's your answer. Which isn't all that clear, right? Like, there's all kind, I mean, there's as much unknown in that issue as there is in the, like, how do I navigate my freedom? You you with me? Have we really solved anything by taking this one question and replacing it with the Holy Spirit? Like, I guess that's what kind of got me thinking, like, who's on, like, we're chasing our tail, kind of. Though I think, like, in a way that honors God, hopefully, because it seems to be what the text is doing. Uh, Remind me of the situation his husband and wife who were having communication issues. What is that? Uh, can you imagine? And uh, they, they decided that they were going to create a moratorium on communication issues. And that didn't mean that they were going to stop communicating, but they were going to stop trying to be each other's Holy Spirit, so to speak, and correcting each other and, like, what's wrong with your communication. And so they just, what they decided was that for uh, two months, they would not talk and address and... Uh, you know, suggest what was wrong with their communication. And instead, what they would do, this was a studious couple, what they decided they would do is they would study. And two months later, they would have dinner, and each of them would produce a thesis, one thing, that what was wrong with their communication. And their thinking was like, we might not nail it, but we'll have two things instead of 400 things, and so we'll disagree that those are going to be the two things we work on until we've nailed them, and then we'll move on. And so they did this, and they read books, and they went to seminars, and you know, they were doing their research separately. One of them interviewed a counselor, another one sat down with all these couples that they respected, and all this research, this uh, podcast, everything you could think of. And two months later, they had dinner, and they sat down across from each other, and, and the wife said to the husband, well, why don't you go first? And he put a piece of paper on the table and had it face down, and she could tell he was nervous, and he was stammering and stuttering, and she's like, come on, would you just communicate? And, uh, and, and finally he said, well, I think the problem is that you're not seven feet tall. How's that for a letdown? <laughs> like, that doesn't make any sense. In fact, I had a friend afterwards like, so what's the end of the story? And I'm like, dude, I made the story up. It, it, it makes no sense, right? It's brainless. It's illogical. And I guess what I want to suggest is I kind of feel like that's what we've done is how do you, how do you navigate freedom? Oh, we'll follow the Holy Spirit. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Speaking of a lack of logic, um, my, my oldest son, uh, he is a barfing phenom. He's, he's eight years old, and he has barfed more in his lifetime than everybody in this room combined. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I know he's barfed more than I have in my lifetime. And, and, and the problem with that for him, like, he's going to see counseling when he's an adult for the way we treated him when he barfed. <laughs> because when he barfs now, it's such a non-event that we're like, flush the toilet, brush your teeth, like, get a good drink of water. Like, there's no sympathy. It's just like, yeah, he's barfing. Like, I'm serious. Like, barf since he, I remember driving to churches when he was a baby. And, I mean, those poor people that bought that Subaru, like, I was scraping all this crusty stuff. It was just... Nasty, nasty stuff. 
So the other night, uh, Sunday night, actually last week, our, our middle kid was with my mom in Missoula, and he was in a play at the Missoula Children's Theater Sunday afternoon, so we drove over there and watched him, and then drove back and got home after 10 o'clock, and you know, so it was one of those like ramrod everyone into bed, I just want to not talk to anybody and stare at the ceiling kind of moments, and so we're laying there in bed and praying that the boys will actually go to sleep before midnight because it's summer, and could we invent something for like summer sleeping hours with our kids? Could we just agree on that? Like at 8 o'clock was so doable a few months ago. Um, so pretty soon we're laying there and we hear Lincoln, or we hear someone coming downstairs and opens the door, hey mom, I'm, I'm sick. And I'm like, go barf. Like, that's, <laughs> that's what you do. Like, like, there's, there's no connection. Like, you can't tell if it's gluten. Like, there's absolutely, like, I'm convinced that Einstein could not create some kind of a connection between when he barfs and what's happened before him barfing. So he goes into the bathroom and, you know, the, just a wall separating our room from the bathroom. And, you, you, you know, like, I can predict it. Okay, there's a gag. But he's gagging. And then barf, barf. And you, you hear the barf. And, and then there's, like, this pause. And then there was more barfing and more barfing. And, and for a kid who barfs a lot, I mean, he just kind of broke his own record. So, so much so that my wife actually got out of bed to go help him. Which I know we sound like horrible parents, but normally it's like, dude, it's what you do. Like, I stub my toe, you barf. That's kind of how this works. So she goes in there, and, and, I, and I heard her say, like, flush the toilet, brush your teeth. And then she goes out in the kitchen, and she comes back. And I guess the nurse in her, she had crackers. And she said, uh, here, eat these crackers, and then she was like, but don't, like, eat them fast and run up to your room and barf again, like, eat them slow, sit on the toilet, like, you know, go slow here, and so, okay, so he does that, she comes back, she's in bed, and uh, it's another 30 seconds go by, and, you know, three kids, so you can kind of predict what's going to happen, do, 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 do. here comes these footsteps, and we hear him go in the bathroom, and then you turn and uh, open the door, and it's Chase, and Chase says, hey, I'm hungry, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so annoyed, you know, like, I'm like, dude, it's after 10 o'clock. And Matrice's like, it's after 10. Go to bed. <laughs> he says, well, why is Lincoln eating? <laughs> and I said, because he just barfed his brains out. <laughs> and he just immediately closed the door. And then we heard him turn. And he looked at Lincoln. And in the most concerned voice, he said, you don't have a brain? <laughs> It was, I haven't laughed that hard in a very long time. <clears throat> I, I guess, with all due respect to God and his word, I, I kind of feel like that's what's happened to us in this situation, is we went looking for these answers, and, and Paul doesn't give them to us. And I think the most honest thing to, to say with the text is, like, Paul doesn't give us five steps to following the Holy Spirit any more than Jesus gives us five steps to following him. What he says is, follow me, and, and here's what your fruit will look like when you do, and, and here's what it'll look like when you don't. But there aren't these easy steps, which doesn't always help. And it raises this question of like, okay, so how do we follow the Holy Spirit? And while I'm, I'd be remiss to offer rules when I, I think God himself doesn't, I do think John 14 offers us some insight. Uh, because in John uh, 14, what we get is Jesus introducing his followers, the original followers, to the concept and the privilege of the Holy Spirit. And what you have to understand contextually is, is he, they're starting to grasp that he's going somewhere. And you've got these 12 guys, you've got these potentially other followers, these women, you've got these people who have so enjoyed like, following him and translating God's character to, to work and to culture and, and to all the issues that we face in life. And they've got to do that just like you did when you were a mentor or growing up. They got to watch Jesus do it, and then they turned, in turn did what he did. And now he's saying, you got to do the same stuff, but I'll be gone. And they're going, dude, can't do it. And, and Jesus says this, if you love me, keep my commands. Now, hold on. Like, we just spent two and a half weeks arguing for a lack of rules. And I don't know if you've read John 14 like I suggested this last week, but right out of the gates it's like, we'll follow my commands. Kind of sounds like Adam's the heretic that some people say he is and maybe he should go away. Because he's saying, like, follow my commands. But what are they? Like, what are his commands? And I think, particularly if you're someone that's not familiar with the Gospels, uh, if you've not read them, then it's really easy to conclude, like, well, so all i got to do is go back to the Gospels and find the commands and then do them. And yet when you tr seek to do that, that's what gets you in a series like this is because you go, even then it's not all that helpful. 
Because really, aren't there two categories of commands? Uh, if I could suggest that, that there are, uh, one that stands out to me is there are, these, there are these types of commands that are very context-specific. Like when Jesus looks at a young man and says, uh, your problem with your spirituality, with your relationship with God is like you've got too tight of a grip on your stuff, so what you should do is sell it all and give the money to the poor. Very context-specific. And we could try to obey that, but most of us would agree like, well, that's not really what's going on there. There's other situations that fall into these context-specific places. Like he says to a guy, uh, pick up your mat and, and go. It's a command. But are we to follow it? Like So many of his commands are, are, are in the first century. And then there's a second type of command uh, that would fall under this category, in my mind. The, these types of commands, are, let, let's just go to Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 19, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Sell everything you have, give to the poor, black, white. This, gray. And and, and his teaching is riddled full of them. Again, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. See, I guess what I want to suggest to you is there's these context-specific commands, and, there's, and then there's what I would call uh, character commands. Well, where it's not so much do, don't do, be, or, or do, don't do, black, white, it's be this kind of person. Don't be this kind of person. Live life with this type of character. Don't live life with this type of character. There's these commands that... that I'm going to argue that when he says, follow my commands, he's talking about character. That what he's saying is, be who I've told you to be. This isn't about, like, read your Bible or not read your Bible or whatever, you know, do or don't you want to list. It's about be this kind of person at work, at home, in marriage. That they're, they're character-specific commands. And, and if you'll buy that that's his focus, then, then watch... Uh, Watch how John 14 then unfolds. If you love me, keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. So here's the Holy Spirit. A group of guys going, how in the world are we going to translate Jesus into our context when he's not here to show us? And Jesus says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who's going to help you. Help you what? Sell everything you have and give to the poor? Or be the kind of person who's good for your word. Be the kind of person who, who treasures God's kingdom more, more than uh, earthly possessions. Uh, is he going to help us translate a certain type of character? Like, well, I don't know about you. I'm guilty of, since I started following Jesus at 19, I've always understood that the benefit of the Holy Spirit is, uh, what I'm realizing is pretty self-absorbed. I've always thought of the Holy Spirit and the way I've read John 14 is it's about, like, emotional, psychological comfort. That no matter where I go and what I do, I'm not alone because God is with me. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all. The context is, be a certain kind of person. Like, follow my commands. Be me in your context. And what he says is, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to help you. Help you what? Could it be that that the Holy Spirit's role and what it means to walk in the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit helps us translate Jesus' character into our context? That that's really the emphasis here and that all the other things and all the other conversations about the Holy Spirit, while they might be necessary, they're not primary. We in evangelicalism have, have attached so many things to the Holy Spirit. But what I would suggest is Jesus says, first and foremost, don't talk to me about your like, spirit-filled living until you're telling me that what it's doing is translating to Christ-centered living. And I don't want to hear about your spirit information until I see that, it, that the Spirit is guiding you towards Christ's character. That seems to be the emphasis. You know, uh, people will ask me from time to time, um, Adam, uh, who, who do you answer to? And what I've 
come to understand as I've had those, several of those conversations is what they're asking me is in reference to Harvest and Journey, our mother churches, and Vern and Brian, the mother church pastors and friends of mine. What they're really asking is, uh, who are you accountable to, which is reasonable. I am a man under authority, them, the council, all these different layers, and I've never been more glad to be so. Uh, but really what they're asking is, what rules did they give you, and, and what's the mechanism by which they're making sure that you're following their rules? That's really where the conversation goes. And, and, and again, it's rather intuitive. I, I don't hold that against people for asking that question. I think that's kind of default thinking. And what I've realized as I've wrestled with this stuff is, well, first of all, they didn't give me any rules. Like, they, they gave us some money. That's gone. Um, <laughs> the, they gave us uh, all kinds of opportunities. But, but they didn't give us any rules. And, and yet, a, a day doesn't pass where I don't go, huh, what, what would Vern, how would Vern react in this situation? What, what would Brian do with this opportunity? Like, they didn't give me any rules, and yet I'm constantly beckoning back and referencing the 10 plus years I spent with them, but what am I referencing? It's their character. I'm not, I'm not referencing any rules that they did or didn't give me. I'm referencing who they were and what they were like and trying to translate their character into my life. I heard an interview with, this week with Bill Hybels, who in my estimation is the, the best church leader of my lifetime. And uh, They asked him, what, what, do you, what do you do when you're facing these difficult situations, these quandaries, the, the stuff that is bigger than your brain? And he said, uh, I, I work really hard to try to figure out what the best leaders ever would do. He said, I, I, I want to know, like, what would Winston Churchill do in this situation? What would Abraham Lincoln do in this situation? He said, I don't want to settle for mid-tier leadership in my life. I want to know who would the best, how would they respond? What's he saying? I'm going to find the people who's in, whose character I like the most, and I'm going to reference it and use it to help guide me. That's not rule-based. It's, it's character-based. Jesus goes on uh, in 25, All this I've spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Why? Well, he's going to reference you back to Christ's character Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Hey, listen, Galatian people. I know you're freaking out. I know you feel like your life's going sideways. I know that what you really want to do is adopt some rules. Uh, Chill out. Because the Holy Spirit's with you and he'll translate Christ's character into your context. Dallas Willard, one of my very favorite theologians, my, my favorite ism from him is, is he says that we all too frequently ask the question, what would Jesus do? And he says it's such an unfortunate question because Jesus' life was already lived and it was lived in a specific context. That, that a much more helpful, much more accurate question is what would Jesus do if he were me? What would Jesus do in my life? Because Jesus' life was context-specific. He lived in a real place, in a real time, and he responded with God's character. And what he's pointing out here is Jesus isn't asking you to relive his life. And he's not asking you to relive Mother Teresa's life. And he's not asking you to relive Winston Churchill's life. And he's not asking you to relive that pastor who you really respect's life. And he's not asking you to relive your parents' life. He's not asking you to relive any of those guys' lives. He's, he's wanting to live his life through you today in a completely new context where he's never lived it before. And you don't do that with rules. You do that under the watchful, guiding eye of the Holy Spirit. Is it more uncomfortable? Absolutely. But it's, it's what he's saying. Now, so how do we do this? What, like, what are the action steps here? Well, I, I think of one uh, immediately, and, and that's the text. And, you know, oftentimes, uh, I've, I've been accused of having a low view of the Bible because I th- say things like it's, it's narrative, and by narrative, I don't mean false, I mean it's story. But the alternative that it's rules, I mean, when's the last time you read a manual? I don't want to call the Bible a manual. I, I've I don't, never read a manual in my life. I'd rather run my finger through the propeller and then learn that way not to do it. <clears throat> like, if, if the goal 
is to realize God's character into your life, then, then far from the Bible not being valuable, it's invaluable. I mean, it, it's the best. And I absolutely believe that it's in our hands uh, by supernatural design. But, but it's there in my estimation more than anything else to help us see God's character in action, to put skin on it, to see real men and women who were wrestling with what does it look like to reconcile God's character into my context. That ultimately, you and I don't believe uh, the points that we, ad- we, don't, we don't live based upon the points that we adopt. We live based upon the stories that we tell and that we believe. And, and that the, the, the quickest way to be transformed by the Bible is to appreciate it as story, not false, but as narrative about people who were trying to follow Jesus in their context. And up and ante from there would be the Gospels. Several years ago, I heard a guy named Ray Vanderland say, like, how can you say you're following Jesus if you're not reading his Gospels like every day? Because that's the guy you're trying to follow. You've got to be familiar with his life. Why? Well, because his character pours out. That's the purpose of Jesus' life, right? Is to put flesh on God. And and so I I don't say we should be people of the text uh, because that makes us good evangelicals or good Christians or because therefore you can check it off your list. I I just go like, how do we possibly reconcile God's character into our life if we're not familiar with the characters in his stories who have gone before us? And that doesn't mean you have to read it. Listen to it if that's what you want to do. Far more Christians in heaven today that never read the Bible in their life than that have. It's, 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 it can be listening. And we live in an age where we have opportunities there that uh, we haven't had for a long time. I just, I would challenge you. If you're someone struggling spiritually, uh, read a chapter a day of the Gospels for a month. And I dare you to have, not that, have that not be used by the Holy Spirit to influence the character with which you work and are in relationship with people. And, and then obviously the, the second piece of that is this all requires an attentiveness to the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? And this is what we mean when we talk about like, like uh, spirit-filled and stuff, is we're like, okay, so how do we actually be aware that he's with us? You know, I was uh, listening to something from a guy named Les Parrott, who is one of the most respected guys out there on relationships and marriage, and he and his wife are both psychiatrists, and they actually do do research like the one I made up, and they, in the last four or five years, I believe, wrote a book, and, and having done a bunch of research, they've published a whole idea, not, not just like, I mean, like scientific, so to speak, uh, publishing, that the most important minute in any marriage is the first minute, the first 60 seconds after a husband and wife uh, come back together, like say, after work. The most important minute is is that moment when the two of you are in the same room and you haven't been for 8, 10, 12 hours, maybe 4 or 5 days. That, That what his research has found is that what happens within the context of that minute determines the rest of the evening and what happens in that relationship. Now, there's a lot there, and you can take that tangent if you want to. Um, but, but I couldn't help but think that, that that same thing must be true of the Holy Spirit. That, that you and I go through a lot of transitions in our day. We get up, and we get ready for work, and we get to work, and we have meetings, and we have lunch, and we come back from lunch, and, and we get done with work. There are these transitions. And I wonder what would happen if we used things like iPhones and calendars and reminders to, to just help us uh, take a minute literally, at those transition points. And, and just kind of reconnect and go, God, like, I've got one goal. And, and it's to honor you out of gratitude for the cross, out of gratitude for grace. It's to honor you by the way I live. And, and I'm navigating freedom, and I am desperate for your help. If you're checking Jesus out and still trying to reconcile him, it's real important to us that you would understand that the gospel is about way more than any individual. That the gospel is Jesus is king, that he's Messiah, that he's Lord, and that we get saved because of the gospel, but the gospel is not people getting saved. That makes it about me, not about God. And that ultimately, uh, the gospel is that God is king. And by grace, we can respond to that and invite him to be king of our lives. And to do that doesn't require any specific prayer or any specific action. It requires a conversation between you and God where you just go, God, I'm in. I love you. You're king. I'm fallen. You've rescued me. 
And you could do that as we close up if you wanted to. God, uh, we're grateful for the Holy Spirit and uh, we just confess to you that we're often uh, guilty of having relationship with two parts of your Trinity and shoving the other one into the corner. Maybe for others of us that that we're looking to the Holy Spirit to provide lots of things in our life, but forefront is not Christ-like character. And we just lay that out in front of you. God, we recognize that, that the project that's unfolding around us and was unfolding before we got here and will continue to unfold when we're gone is, is your reconciling all things to yourself. And that we're a part of that and we're privileged to be part of that. God, you're bigger. And so uh, we just confess, God, your, your, your will, not ours, be done. 